Euromax Highlights. And here's your host, Karin Helmstedt. Greetings from Berlin and welcome to our Highlights edition, a wonderfully mixed bag as usual with these topics. Double trouble, the Hanna twins are Germany's fastest female marathon runners. Flower power, a peek into Cordoban courtyards at the Fiesta de los Patios. And number crunchers, data cuisine aims to make statistics easier to digest. Catalan architect Antoni Gaudí was apparently unruffled when asked about delays in the building progress of his masterpiece, the Sagrada Familia. My client is not in a hurry, he's quoted as saying. And ever since, the Basilica in Barcelona has been Europe's most famous construction site. Building has been going on since 1882, and when Gaudí died in 1926, only one facade and one of the 18 planned steeples was finished. Well, despite the ever-present building cranes, the church was named a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2005 and remains one of the city's biggest draws. The Sagrada Familia is the landmark of Barcelona. Work has been underway on the Basilica by renowned Catalan architect Antoni Gaudí for the last 134 years. It has been called eternally incomplete. Jordi Fauli, the seventh chief architect since Gaudí himself, took over in 2012. He's been part of the team since 1990. I started working on the Sagrada Familia after Jordi Bonnet, the architect at the time, recommended me. Back then, the office only had four people. Now we've got a staff of almost 50. This is what the church might look like when finished, with 18 spires and four facades. Gaudí worked on his masterpiece for over 40 years, until the day in 1926 when he was hit and killed by a streetcar. The architects who followed him came from all parts of the world. The Sagrada Familia Foundation raises the funding to continue the work. Donations and admissions are the only source. Neither the Spanish state nor the Roman Catholic Church contribute. It costs about 25 million euros a year to continue the construction. Gaudí planned the construction of the Sagrada Familia in a way that was very unusual for cathedrals. It's been built in separate parts. He didn't begin with the central nave, but had his builders construct the nativity facade first to set an example for the future. Gaudí was an intuitive architect. His ideas often came to him spontaneously at work, but his design was no less sophisticated. The church is 90 meters long, punctuated by columns seven and a half meters apart. The Sagrada Familia's dimensions are comparable to Mallorca's Parma Cathedral or the Cologne Cathedral, at least in terms of the floor plan. But at 172 meters, the bell tower will be the highest spire. That will make the Sagrada Familia the tallest church building on earth. But Gaudí's own construction plans burned up in a fire. He worked with plaster models, but most of them were destroyed in the 1930s during the Spanish Civil War. 3D models and computer animations have helped to close some of the gaps in Gaudí's master plan. Our objective is to complete the project while staying as true as possible to Gaudí's ideas. Our primary resource has been a detailed study of what little information he left behind. We have to make his vision reality. The vision behind the Sagrada Familia has been dogged by controversy from the start. In the 1950s, Bauhaus architects Walter Kropius and Le Corbusier signed a petition calling for work to be stopped. In 2008, Spanish artists and architects made the same demand. But aside from a few neighbors worried that they'll be evicted, few protest against it today. 
Evidentemente, somos the building is so well known that a broad diversity of opinions is only to be expected. The completed exterior with its 18 spires will present a very distinctive sight, depending on your perspective. The Daily Mass has been important in winning popular acceptance. Holy Communion has been held here since 2010, when Pope Benedict XVI consecrated it as a basilica. The Sagrada Familia may well be Barcelona's prime tourist attraction, making it priceless economically. Over three million visitors come to see it each year. We made a deal that if it finishes and we are 80 maybe, we will be back to see it completely. <laughs> Now the builders are aiming for completion in 2026, 100 years after Gaudí's death. But those familiar with cathedrals will know that they are never really finished. Well, they're touted as the fastest marathon twins in the world, and Lisa and Anna Hanna are indeed Germany's fastest female distance runners. The marathon is their favorite distance, and they've already made the Olympic qualification times. But speed is just a part of their talent, because at 26, the Hanna twins have long since turned their passion into a profession, and we met up with two exceptional athletes for whom the journey is the reward. Lisa and Anna Hanna are truly two of a kind. Twins who are both world-class marathon runners. Every week they run a total of 200 kilometers, a labor of love for the two sisters. For us, running is freedom. You can do it whenever and wherever you want, and you can explore nature and move at the same time. It's just fantastic. It gives you the feeling of being centered, free and independent. The twins are stars on the German marathon circuit. Here's Anna at the 2015 Berlin Marathon and Lisa that same year in Frankfurt. She finished in two hours, 28 minutes and 39 seconds, recording a personal best and earning her the title of German champion. We're rivals and teammates. We run against and with each other, but with both of us trying to be the fastest. We've been used to competing with one another since we were kids, so there are never any hard feelings when the other one wins. Actually, it's a challenge. Next time, I'll beat you. <laughs> the twins hail from the village of Rümmels near Fulda in central Germany. They were into sports from an early age. They got into running at the age of 17, after attending a talk by musician and extreme athlete Joey Kelly. Now 26, they're at the top of their field, and they've turned into successful businesswomen. The Hanna twins finance their athletic pursuits with their own sponsored website, and are also very active on social media. We want other people to have a part in our journey. Instead of only hearing about us when we're famous, we want them to see our evolution as athletes. The road to the top is not always a straight one. There are always bends as well. And people have been eager to track their development. They hold lectures for amateur sportsmen and women and managers. And the Hanna Twins Club is also running well. It's an online community where Anna and Lisa give tips to fun runners. It currently has around 200 members. Revenue from the site covers the costs for the Twins training program. And needing twice as many calories as non-athletes, they've also drawn up a collection of recipes for banana muffins and other high-energy foods. They're available online and in their new book. The Hana twins are inseparable, working, running, living, and cooking together. Our secret is always being frank with one another. If there's something bothering us, we talk about it. When we really need to be on our own, one of us will go to the left and the other to the right. An hour later, we'll meet again and everything is fine. As is that daily batch of muffins. They've already been able to get a taste of Rio de Janeiro ahead of the Summer Olympics, while there for a promotional campaign. 
But for Anna and Lisa, the real focus now is on making it to the games. Our biggest dream is to run in the Olympics in Rio. 9 a.m. on August 14th, we want to be at the starting line in the Sambo Drome and make it to the finish, and then fall into each other's arms. The final pick for Germany's Olympic team will be made at the end of May. If their dream comes true, or whether they will even win a medal, is still up in the clouds. But either way, they are without a doubt a perfect pair. Well, every year in Córdoba, in southern Spain, they celebrate the Fiesta de los Patios, or Festival of Courtyards, in May. Now, these private spaces have a long tradition in Andalusia, where they were originally built to offer some respite from the searing summer heat. Well, later they were then richly decorated with colorful mosaics and fountains and a lot of greenery to keep them cool. Now, in 2012, the historic center of Córdoba was added to UNESCO's list of intangible world heritage and now is the best time to get a glimpse into this otherwise sequestered inner world. Cordoba is famous for having the most beautiful interior courtyards in Spain, where they're called patios. Every year in the first week of May, the annual patio festival gets underway. Local resident Rafael Cordoba is among those taking part. He's putting the finishing touches on the flower pots and sprucing up the plants on his patio. I have 400 flower pots, so that's a lot of wilted leaves to remove. When you're not busy watering, you're applying fertilizer or paint. The house is very old, from the 16th century. Araceli Lopez is also doing some last-minute tidying up before the visitors start streaming in. She shows us her trusted and traditional watering system, a long stick and a tin can. Araceli bought this property just a short time ago. We decided to buy the house so that we could preserve this old patio. It's at least 350 years old. Courtyards in Córdoba go back to Roman times. Designed to provide houses with a cool refuge from the heat, the tradition was continued by the Moors, who built the great mosque and now cathedral and left a lasting impact on local architecture, despite the city returning to Christian rule in 1236. The colors and scents came from the Arabs. They did their thing. They loved these vertical gardens, but they wanted to keep them to themselves. They closed the doors and enjoyed their patio. Most of the city's 4,000 courtyards are still closed today, but 60 open up to visitors during the 14-day festival. That means long queues outside homes like Rafael Cordova's, but the wait is well worth it. Beautiful. We're here for the first time and we like it, though we've only seen three or four. I didn't expect it to be this nice. It's rather unique. You really have to be in the patios to understand the colors, the scents, and the light. It's wonderful. Not just locals and tourists visit the courtyards. The festival is also a contest, and so a judging panel stops by to cast their votes for the best patios. There are different categories for historical patios and more contemporary ones. This year, 47 courtyards are in competition. One of the judges is a biologist, and for her, it's about more than just the lovely colors. Of course, the variety of flowers plays a role, but it's the atmosphere that really matters. The water, the music, and what we can smell as we come in. It's all about that initial emotion. The first courtyard festival was celebrated in 1918. It dates back to a time when large single-family villas were turned into multi-family homes. The rooms were so small that people spent a lot of time in the courtyards. Residents would decorate their entrances, painting the flower pots as they liked. And because it was particularly delightful in the springtime, they decided to open their doors to visitors so they could see all the beauty on display.
The crowds have been coming ever since. Locals like Rafael make a huge effort to make their prized patios even more beautiful to win over the judges. He's won countless awards, but his real motivation is the memories. There were flowers here when I was a kid. My grandparents have since died. I want to keep the patio and flowers alive in their memory. Every year, people come from far and wide to witness this unique spectacle when the courtyards of Córdoba spring into bloom. In 2016, the German car manufacturer BMW, originally the Bavarian Motor Works, celebrates a milestone 100th birthday. And for the centenary celebrations, they've unveiled a brand new classic center that connects the present to the company's illustrious past. Well, the building is part museum, part archive, and part auto shop, and will house a large part of BMW's classic collection. Business with old-timer cars is booming these days, and our reporter had some exclusive access to the new building. Prince Leopold of Bavaria on the streets of Munich in his BMW 326. The aristocrat and former racing driver feels a strong attachment to his beloved vintage sedan. It's like dealing with a very old lady. You need to be very cautious and gentle. This car was built in 1939, that's quite a while ago. You can't drive it too fast, you just cruise down the road with it. This is his first visit to BMW's new home for its classic cars. Every inch of the expansive site revolves around the company's heritage. In addition to workshops for repairing and restoring old beamers, the center exhibits models from the carmaker's 100-year history. Prince Leopold knows a number of them, in particular the 328. I know this car and how it behaves like the back of my hand. I love it. Its form and its handling. When you've driven a car for thousands of miles, it finds a place in your heart. I'd like to have a car like this, but I can't afford it. If you don't want to buy a vintage beauty, you can lease one from BMW Classic. For over 30 years now, Klaus Kutscher has been tracking down old models from all over the world for the BMW collection. He found this 507 in a barn in the United States. It once belonged to Elvis Presley. It's now being restored, true to the original. It had been disfigured. The seats had been quilted in diamond shapes in the style of the 70s. The interior and the mechanical elements could barely be recognized as a BMW 507. The center is on the very same site where Bayerische Motorenwerke started out building airplane engines 100 years ago. BMW bought back the grounds a few years ago. They're under a monument preservation order. Manfred Grunert is responsible for the concept and architecture of the BMW Classic Center. It's an investment that pays off for the company's image. If you get to 100 years old, that's an achievement. And it's only natural to want to underscore that significance by cultivating the tradition. It makes you stand out from the rest. And one thing that can't be copied is history. Prince Leopold of Bavaria isn't the only vintage car fan to profit from BMW's century of experience. The vehicles should be as authentic to the original as possible. Take a look at the gear shift knob. Wasn't it black or was the original white? We have all the documentation on the 326 in our archive, so we can find out right away. Klaus Kutscher checks the chassis number of Prince Leopold's car against the documents from the archives to see when and where BMW built it and what specifications and features it had. We now have a clear indication whether the knob was white or black. Here in the sales prospect is shown in black. The replacement knob will be delivered and installed in two weeks. 
The BMW Classic has more experience than anyone else. When you pick your car up, it's guaranteed to function. It's tricky driving with such an old car. You don't take it on the autobahn, just on country roads. You just enjoy the drive and people waving at you. BMW Classic, a new venue for vintage car aficionados. Well, it's one of those mega trends that is impacting every aspect of our lives. Big data, the reams of information collected from every step of our routines, from paying with a credit card to traveling by subway. Every move we make is recorded and evaluated, but not everyone likes to be reduced to such an abstract mountain of statistics. So two Germans tried to find a new way to approach big data and break it down, so to speak, into bite-sized pieces that people can digest. And the result is a culinary experiment called data cuisine. Here, abstract statistics take on a whole new meaning. At data cuisine workshops, people create dishes which say far more than what's written in their recipes. For instance, the percentage of women in science in different countries is represented here by the size of the egg yolks. Susanna Yashko and Moritz Stefana whipped up the idea for data cuisine. For the last four years, they've been conducting two-day cooking workshops where data turns into recipes across Europe. I thought we need to get people interested in the data that's out there because they're facts, but not everyone can relate to these statistics or the world of numbers. So we used food to try to find a medium that's personal and emotional, and which you can use to tell the stories found in this data. Participants decide which statistics to use, ideally those which come from their surroundings and are relevant to them. They call these local data. This data cuisine workshop is being held in Jean Bleu, Belgium. Here at the Smart Gastronomy Lab at the University of Liège, they use state-of-the-art kitchen appliances. There's even a 3D printer for making chocolates. Arlene, a workshop participant, shows that data cuisine is even suited to somewhat somber topics. Our idea is to um, play off the, the Belgian praline, this chocolate that you're never sure what's inside. And so we're making these small chocolate coffins and we will fill them with various fillings that represent the ways that people die in Belgium. Now it's time to put their ideas into action. To make sure the database dishes also taste good, participants receive tips from a professional chef. Arlen is creating the various fillings which stand for the different causes of death. For six hours, the designer from Antwerp fills pralines until they reflect the situation in Belgium. You can either have a regular ganache, um, which a large percentage of them have, which means that you have a, a normal death. Um, it, this is based on Belgian statistics. Or you have a cancer-related death, which has, uh, I think there's about four of them that have cancer-related causes. Um, and this is a cardiovascular-related death. This one represents respiratory disease. There's just one of them that has respiratory disease. Now the pralines are waiting for their photo op. It's important to document the various data dishes before they will be eaten. The other goodies are also taking shape. They cover a wide range of topics, from the motivation level of Belgian workers to nuclear power. These participants tackled the changeability of the weather in Europe last April, with temperatures reflective of all four seasons. The result is an edible calendar. Food isn't a medium we normally use to present information. It's also not terribly precise. You really can't say whether something tastes twice as sweet or three times as sweet. Still, consuming something that takes such a sensuous form makes you look at data differently. Because that's what data cuisine aims to do. Help people internalize data in the truest sense of the word. That's why participants eat the dishes together at the end of the workshop and explain the stories behind them. 
And with that, our time is up. So until we meet again from all of us here in Berlin, alles Gute und auf Wiedersehen.